Hello and welcome. Would the world allow another Darfur? For ethnic Somalis living in the Ogaden region of Ethiopia, the horrors they face justify the comparison. Unfortunately, the violent separatist conflict in Ogaden is far from the media's eyes and over 15 years has claimed tens of thousands of lives. It's an area of Ethiopia that's home to about 5 million people, mostly ethnic Somali nomads, located between Oromia to the west, the Republic of Djibouti to the north, Kenya to the south, and the Somali Republic to the east. And although it's a largely inhospitable area, it's rich in natural gas. A long and complicated colonial history has defined this area. The Armed Ogaden National Liberation Front, or ONLF, resistance began in 1994 when they broached the idea of splitting from Ethiopia. The central government then imprisoned several Ogadani leaders and more recently labeled them terrorists, linking them to Al-Qaeda. But the escalation in fighting began in 2007 after an ONLF attack on a Chinese-run exploration field that resulted in the death of 74 Ethiopian guards and Chinese workers. Well, since then, the area has been sealed off by the Ethiopian army. The Ogadeni allege systematic assassination, torture, and rape at the hands of the Ethiopian soldiers. But the United States, which gives the country millions in aid, has remained mostly quiet on the issue as it considers Ethiopia its main ally in combating terrorism in the Horn of Africa. On today's show, we ask, is the conflict in the Ogaden region another Darfur? Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments. Log on to livestation.com forward slash AJE. Enter the chat room and you can take part. And we also welcome your phone calls on the show, too. For our discussion, we have three people who are more than uh, aware of what's going on in Ogaden. In Ottawa, Canada, there is Fauzia Abdul Qadir, an independent researcher and human rights activist who testified before the U.S. Congress on the situation in the Ogaden region. With me here in the studio is Gregory Stanton, the founder and president of Genocide Watch and president of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. Dr. Stanton served in the State Department for several years, where he drafted the United Nations Security Council resolutions that created the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Also with me in the studio is Ambassador David Shin, who was with the U.S. Foreign Service for 37 years, working in several embassies around Africa, including service as the U.S. Ambassador to Ethiopia. He's currently adjunct professor at George Washington University. I welcome you all to the show. After Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fozia Abdul Qadir, Thank if I could you. start with you uh, there uh, in Ottawa and, and ask uh, this, this description or this comparison that's being made between Ogaden and Darfur, is there, is there any real realistic comparison? I would say so. Um, I think what has happened in the Ogaden, uh, particularly in the last, since 2007, when all the international NGOs, such as the International Red Cross and Médecins Sans Frontières, were kicked out is it has been closed off and there is a heavy military sweeping operation that is killing civilians uh, and, and everybody in sight. So there is definitely a hidden Darfur in the Ogaden case. Now I know you've, you've blamed both the Ethiopian government and the international community. In what way do you feel the international community is responsible? Well, uh, they're not responsible, but there, isn't, there hasn't been a response to the fact that there is humanitarian crisis and human rights abuses. We have been writing about this since 1996, and recently Human Rights Watch has written a report titled Collective Punishment. Uh, there has been a UN humanitarian uh, commission to check the crisis in terms of the people who are starving. It seems like there hasn't been a response and uh, enough pressure on the Ethiopian government to open up this place. Okay. The, the region is closed off to media and everybody. Okay. Well, Dr. Gregory Stanley, if I could ask you, so what, what you've heard about what's going on in Ogaden? Well, we uh, keep track of uh, Ogaden, and we think it's one of the uh, most likely places to explode um, into genocidal killing. Uh, one of the things a lot of people don't understand about genocide is that it is not an all or none thing. It builds up. And um, we think that the atrocities that are happening in um, the Ogaden region uh, have genocidal implications. It's very clear that the Ethiopian army is uh, carrying out mass atrocities. When the, the attacks seem to be really brutal, uh, reading what, what's going on. Why, why, why this intense brutality? Why is it so, so vicious, in your opinion? Dr. Stanton. Well, one of the real uh, w early warning signs uh, of genocide is when they close off an area so that no foreigners can see what's happening. Mm -hmm. They've done that. Uh, the, um, the next thing that they will do is essentially dehumanize the population by uh, carrying out mass rape, uh, killing all the men in villages 
We've seen this in a number of villages. The Human Rights Watch report uh, uh, gives plenty of uh, examples of that. One village, for instance, where at least 1,500 people were killed. Um, I think that the atrocities have to do with terrorizing people essentially into leaving. Um, the, the, the pattern is to when they discover uh, major resources like gas or oil, to try to drive uh, nomadic peoples off of those lands. Okay. I'll touch on some of these in, in, in a moment as well. Ambassador, it's good to have you with, with us as well, sir. Okay. Um, who, do you, do, who do you hold accountable for what's happening? Quite frankly, I hold both sides accountable for what's happening. And, and uh, going back to the question as to whether this is another Darfur or not, mm -hmm. I think it's very important to make a, a, a critical distinction. If one is talking about Darfur in 2003 and 2004, when things were really totally out of control, what is happening in the Ogaden today is nothing like that whatsoever. If one is talking about Darfur today, where you have basically low-level uh, intensity conflict going on, then perhaps you could make a comparison. But it's a very critical comparison. And uh, even though the, the government ultimately is responsible for what happens in its country, I think there have been abuses on the, uh, on the Ogadeni side, too. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Stanton mentioned that the issue of reserves, of the, the, you know, the resources there. Um, how much is this an issue of the rich gas reserves in the area and, and control of those? I mean, is it a, pol a political one as well? It is, and it's both political and economic. It's quite true that there are uh, significant natural gas reserves there. It's not possible to... Um, uh, to do anything with them at the present time because of the, uh, of the political situation in the country. But I think clearly the government in, um, in Addis Ababa on the one hand, and obviously the Ogadenis on the other, of uh, great desire to make maximum use of these rich resources someday. Okay. Let's get a call in from Ahmed, who's been waiting patiently on the line from D.C. Ahmed, what would you like to ask? Hi, Riz. My Hi. question is, uh, how can Western leaders stand with uh, the leader of Ethiopia, Mo Zanawi, as they did during you know, the G20 summit and in Latula, last month, while they ostracized other leaders like that of, um, th that of Sudan and, and uh, Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe. Okay. Thank Thank you. Uh, actually, Ambassador, this is one for you, and, and it's an issue that the U.S. Has, a, has had quite a confused role in, in the region, uh, supporting one side on one hand, you know, supporting uh, the Ethiopian government on one side and, and before supporting the Somali government. To, to what degree is that causing part of the problem and the confusion? Well, I think you were quite right in the opening uh, cut to indicate that the United States has been relatively quiet on the Obedani question. Uh, as I say, I, I don't compare it to what happened in Darfur in 2003-2004, so there's a, there is a very important distinction between the two. But uh, one, one could argue that this is an issue about which more should be said. Part of the problem is getting the facts. Uh, the area has been cut off, and uh, foreigners can't go in there, and it's very hard to know what the real facts are of the situation. Okay, Ali is uh, on the line from the UK. Ali, what would you like to ask? Uh, we know that we are, uh, Ethiop as Ethiopian Somalis, uh, mm -hmm. we are very much contented with the administration and uh, we feel very safe and uh, we have very much, uh, we've, we've got a lot of development so far under the EPRDF and uh, this issue, uh, did the, you people consider that the, there is a, a, a group behind uh, the whole scenario which is causing disability in, uh, in the area? and, uh, and uh, uh, what do you call, uh, like the Eritreans and uh, other groups. Otherwise, uh, we, we know that we have reached a lot of development. Uh, okay, Ali, Ali, I presume you're referring to the ONLF. Yeah, I, no, I mean not the ONLF. I mean the ONLF are being supported by uh, uh, other, other groups like... Uh, I mean, uh, the Eritreans and uh, okay, uh, some other people, yeah. That's, that's what we let know. Me, and let me put this to, uh, to Fawzia Abdul Qadir. Um, the comment Ali is making is that perhaps there's a lot of interference here which is complicating the situation, that there has been development for the Ogadanis. I would have to respectfully disagree with that. Uh, we need to really underline the fact that historically, Somalis have been always marginalized in Ethiopia. This is not something that started with the current regime. They have been always marginalized. However, the current regime has escalated uh, the number of civilians that are being jailed constantly, the number of people that are being tortured, and the number of women that are being raped constantly. And I would have to also uh, highlight a similarity to Darfur, where this current regime has created a parallel security structure outside of the federal security structures and recruited militias for this region. This is a region that is heavily militarized. 
And now we, ha we have militia like the Janjaweed, raping at random, killing people, jailing people. There are jails named the Ogaden jails that are people being taken to. Young 15-year-old girls are being raped, gang raped. Grandmothers are being gang raped. This is something that has not been seen before. Okay. So I would have to disagree with the caller who said there is development. Let's, we've got a caller from Ethiopia on the line. Michael is on the line. Michael, what would you like to ask? Uh, well, it's not a question. It's in fact that it's a comment. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm very shocked to hear that uh, you are comparing the situation in, in Ogaden with, uh, with Darfur because we in Ethiopia, we don't believe uh, such kind of thing are happening in Ogaden region because we consider Ogaden, is Ethio they are Ethiopian, they are our brothers, and uh, uh, Ogaden people have the same right like any uh, Ethiopians living uh, in the nation. Secondly, when it comes to this about gas situation or this petrol which is discovered in Ogaden, it has been discovered by the Americans 40, 50 years ago, and we never utilize it because it's not worth to invest that much money to to to, to get economic right, benefits. Okay. okay, Michael, thank you. And what I'm going to do before we get on to more of these issues that, that have been raised, uh, we're going to take a short break here. As we pause, let me remind you, you can join the conversation with your questions and comments by logging on to livestation.com and entering the chat room. You can see there's a debate taking place in there. Uh, if you go in there, we'll be right back. <laughs> Ah, 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 ah,